I spent um, the last part of my education at boarding school in Bristol called Clifton College. Clifton College was about half an hour's walk from the town centre. And on Friday afternoons, after lunch, you could line up outside <coughs> the housemaster's study to ask him any question you wanted. I had a question to ask him. Please, sir, may I go down to the city centre any time I want without asking your permission? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very big ask, because boys were forbidden to go down to the town centre. Uh, we were supposed to stay on campus. Anyway, so on this Friday, I lined up outside the housemaster's study. Quite a long queue there. You could ask him about money, sport, travel, work, whatever was on your mind. So that was my question. Anyway, my turn came, so I went in, I stood before his desk, and I said, please, sir, may I go down to the city centre without asking your permission any time I want? Do you know what he said? Straight away, without any hesitation, he said, yes, that's fine. Call the next four years. I was quite... <laughs> trusted me. He knew that I wasn't going down there to go smoking, or swilling in the bars down there, or fishing chips in public, and in other ways dishonouring the school uniform. He trusted me. Now, in this story, Peter is standing before Jesus. Jesus is about to ascend into the heavens, and he's going to turn over the church which hasn't even begun, to Peter and the others. Is Peter trustworthy? Is he the kind of guy who will do this? Who will really um, come under authority? Will uh, seek to put Jesus first? Is this the kind of guy who, who Jesus can trust? And by extension, you see, you and I in our day, we stand before Jesus. He is committing the church into our hands. Uh, we are his plan in Oakington. He doesn't have another plan. He is not here. He is risen. He is returning, but not today. Are we trustworthy? Will you and I carry this responsibility? Or will we duck it or try and bend it in the direction which you and I feel comfortable with? Well, as Peter stands before Jesus, I do hope that you and I are encouraged by this because <coughs> Peter is really extremely flaky. Uh, actually, I mean, we know the backstory, don't we? You see, actually, Jesus wasn't called by, Peter wasn't called by Jesus at the beginning. He was taken to Jesus by Andrew, his brother, who said, come and see what we've found. So he wasn't there uh, terribly intentionally. And anyway, no sooner had Jesus seen him than he said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, huh. uh, you see, his real name is Simon, but Jesus is giving him this nickname, Rock Man. That's what Peter means, rock. Well, Rock Man, Peter was not. Generous, uh, impulsive, and uh, very, very variable. <coughs> not Rock Man at all. And we see this working out um, all the way through the Gospel stories. So, for example, uh, at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says to them, Who do you think I am? And Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, because God has revealed this to you, not mankind. So Jesus has, uh, Peter has received this revelation, very important. But then, Jesus goes on to talk about his crucifixion. And immediately Peter says, No, Lord, this won't happen to you. So you see, Peter agrees that he's the Messiah, but he wants Jesus to fit into what he, Peter, wants the Messiah to be. If Jesus is to have the honour of Peter following him, he's got to uh, deserve that honour by taking into account Peter's views on these things. And Jesus says, Get thee behind me. Wow. You 
You see, it's pride, isn't it? As we were seeing through Lent. This is our natural disposition. Independence from God. And it's fueled from hell. So here is Peter, full of pride, you see. And on, on another occasion, when, when Jesus is laid aside his robe and picked up a towel, and he's washing the disciples' feet, Peter says, not me, Lord. I won't have you wash my feet. So Jesus says to Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you won't be clean. So Peter says, okay then, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. No submission there either. You see, first of all, he doesn't want any of it. Then he wants more than Jesus is offering. He wants it to be done in his way. Do we not recognize these things? Another example is when, the last example is when um, he says to Jesus, I'll follow you to the end, I'll die with you. Well, that's okay. The lights are on, everybody's there. All this sort of camaraderie and love. Uh, but Jesus says, you'll deny me three times. It seems impossible. But on another occasion, when it's dark and cold, and he's on his own, and there's a mocking uh, servant. He denies Jesus three times. So, Peter stands before Jesus. But even though he's so flaky, Jesus is commissioning him. We are flaky too. But we've been commissioned. And look what Jesus says to Peter. He does not say, well, okay, the starting salary is 30,000, and if you get it right, it might go up to 50,000. He does not say, let me see your CV. Which university did you go to? <coughs> what kind of degree did you get? Um, what are your experience and qualifications of life? And will you please explain to me how uh, being a fisherman qualifies you to run the church? And let me see your certificate, which uh, shows you know how to climb up a step ladder. <laughs> and what is your health and safety certificate? Let me see them. And what's your policy on diversity and uh, LGBT and so on? And what about your stance on equality? None of that at all. Because you see, God is not really interested. <coughs> in us, if you know what I mean. Our qualifications is not what the kingdom of God stands or falls on. What Jesus says to Peter is, do you love me? That's the question. Do you love me? And it doesn't come out in the English, it certainly comes out in the Greek, because when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me, he uses the word agape. Do you love me with this agape love? So what is agape love? There are various words in Greek for this one English word love. And the word agape love in Greek is really the highest form of love. It's that universal beneficence and benevolence to anybody, however unlovely they may be. All too often I love people because they are lovely or they evoke love in me. That's not agape love, because there's a self-element there, and it can lead to manipulation <coughs> and jealousy. But this agape love is this beneficence and malevolence to everyone, whoever they are. It's described in 1 Corinthians 13, a passage we know well, I'm sure. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, never gives up. That is the quality which Jesus is asking of Peter, do you love me? And it's the love of God. That's what that is. Jesus said, uh, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. But actually, 
We are the enemies of God, naturally speaking, because of pride, because of this um, terrible desire for independence. We're naturally speaking in the rebel camp. We are not lovely to God. But he loves us, not because we're lovely, but because he is love. And the most astonishing and amazing example of this in history is the cross. Where Jesus died for us and paid the price for our sins, which we richly deserve to pay the price for ourselves, he has paid the price that we might come into the kingdom. That's agape love. So he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies, you know that I love you. But he uses a different Greek word. He uses the word philia. Philio love is a step down from agape love because of the element of self-centeredness in it. We can't help this. It's just the way we are. I love my wife because if I don't, nuclear war is liable to break out. <laughs> I love my children. I want them to succeed. I take a great interest in them. I guide them in the right direction. I'm gutted when it doesn't work. But it's not agape love exactly because I have an interest in this. I want them to succeed where I didn't. I want them to live, I want to live through them. Their success is important to me, my self-respect, my reputation. I love my neighbour because if I don't love my neighbour, things won't be very good. I remember when I was a dry grater, there were two old boys who lived next door to each other. One was 89 and the other was 87. Their gardens had all gone to blazes, so they got somebody in to clear the gardens. And when he cleared the huge expanse of uh, bramble through which the, head, the fence ran, they discovered that the fence was about six inches too far into the other guy's garden. War broke out. You never did. These two old boys approached each other on their zimmer frames, <laughs> swearing like anything, waving their crutches and trying to bash one another on the head. <laughs> it wasn't funny, really. It's really sad. But you know, if you don't love your neighbour, that's what you get. You see. So filio love has that element of self in it. As I said, we can't help it. But Peter replies, you know that I love you. He knows that agape love is not his quality. <laughs> so Jesus asks him again, uh, Peter, do you love me? Again, he uses the word agape. And Peter replies, Lord, you know that I love you. He uses the word filia. But then Jesus asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And instead of using the word agape, he uses the word philia. And that's why Peter is so uh, disturbed by this. Because whilst um, Jesus is questioning his agape love, which Peter knows he doesn't have now, Jesus is questioning his friendship. Are you really a friend of mine, Peter? And Peter replies, Lord, you know that I'm philia. You know that I'm a friend of yours. You see, there are two scales here. One is ascending and the other is descending. So the de descending scale is this. Um, Jesus uses the word agape <coughs> once, agape twice, and then philia. That's the descending scale. But then, at the same time, there's an ascending scale. He starts by saying, feed my lambs. Then he says, uh, tend the flock. Then he says, feed my sheep. So that's an ascending scale. Um, feed my lambs is the easiest thing. Any farmer knows that after lambing, some, there'll be some spare lambs because the mum has died or has rejected them or has had too many. So the farmer will have um, a field near the house where these lambs are. So he just rush, feeds them with a bottle. He knows that they, they will grow up and they can go with the rest of the flock. He's not worried about the rest of the lambs. The mothers are looking after them. So that's a fairly easy job. Then Jesus says, the, the next step up is, tend my flock. Well, that's a much bigger job, but it's much more general. I remember when I was on the island of Muck, the Archie 
the shepherd was out in the hills tending the flock, just looking over them, not doing anything but looking. And I heard him in the mists singing Gallic songs. <laughs> it was a very romantic scene, but it is, isn't it? There it is, there are the sheep. They look after themselves, but the shepherd needs to tend them. But then at the top of the scale, Jesus says, Feed my sheep. That's not so easy. When you, when you get born again, that's not the end, that's the beginning. You then have to be discipled. You have to come to know the Lord. You have to learn the things of faith. Um, you have to commit yourself to the sayings of Jesus and to know them. You have to die to self and stop trying to bend the program in a way which you like and which makes you feel comfortable. Uh, the church is the most difficult part of the Christian life to take. God has set it up specially to annoy everybody. <laughs> As, as we know. And we have to come under its authority. And this is the place where the rubber hits the road. So you see, even though Peter is flaky, Jesus commissions him. His love is not perfect, but he is a friend of Jesus. We too are friends of Jesus, aren't we? That's why we're here. We're friends of Jesus. We do not have a huge measure of agape love, but we do have and we stand here ashamed of our record and repentant and we are commissioned and uh, this is the place where God has called us that we may discover our ministry and move in it and then you see that's not the end of the story it is this morning because Pentecost hasn't come yet it's coming when it has come but we're remembering it again later but um, Jesus also said, if you love me, obey me, and what? If you love me, obey me, and you must know this. It's very important. I'm sure you do, really. I know you do. What? If you love me, obey me, and I will send the Holy Spirit. We're friends of Jesus. We lack. We lack. But he's not disinterested in whether I am clever enough to run the church. That's not the concern. It's what he does in me and through me, through his Holy Spirit. So the important thing, you see, is not my success or talents, but my love for Jesus, which will lead me to obey him. And then the Holy Spirit will come to me and will fill me. And it's in the Greek, it's a continuous present, which means that we are filled with the Holy Spirit and go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continuous relationship. And you see, when the Holy Spirit came on Peter, there was a great transformation. He became rock man. The flakiness uh, faded away. And he became a tremendous leader in the church. <coughs> we too are tremendous in the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to the disciples, don't rush out there and start the church just now you see me rise from the dead. Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So that's what they did. And the Holy Spirit <coughs> came upon them. One of the really encouraging things, I think, is the Thursday prayer meeting. Because our heart is for revival. That's what, it, that's what our heart is, the Thursday prayer meeting. That's not a work of man. Revival is, is very inconvenient and, and uh, difficult. It's not what we would naturally choose. But <laughs> God has put that on our heart. <laughs> God has put that on our hearts. <coughs> and the prayers which God puts in our hearts, he answers. The Holy Spirit has been poured out and we can receive this. We who have been committed towards God, He will see that we enter into all that He has for us, so that we may be the place in Oakington where the, the, the community around us, which observes us pretty acutely, I think, uh, will see that there is a God in His world. <coughs> Praise God, glory be, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm going to sing again now. <laughs>